Between 1988 and 1993, the Soviet Russian metropolis was gripped by a string of unsolved murders, each more gruesome than the last. But amidst the chaos, one name sent shivers down the spines of all who heard it, Sergei Vasilievich, also known as the Balashika River or the Hippopotamus due to his large size. Sergei Vasilievich Rykovsky was a notorious Soviet Russian rapist and serial killer who killed 19 people in Moscow. His targets often included homosexuals and prostitutes, whom he believed were a blight on society and sought to eliminate. Despite his focus on these groups, most of his victims were elderly women, although he also murdered five men and two teenagers. Sergei's preferred methods of killing were stabbing or strangulation, using either his bare hands or a rope. After his victims had died, he would mutilate their bodies, focusing primarily on the genital area. Some corpses of Rakovsky's victims would have sexual acts performed upon them. These terrible acts show how cruel and brutal Rakovsky was. But the question is, what could have prompted this kind of bizarre behavior, and most importantly, how did he manage to evade justice for six years? Hello, and welcome to Maya's Reality Channel, where we bring you compelling true crime stories. From unsolved mysteries to notorious criminals, we leave no stone unturned as we navigate the dark corridors of real-life crimes. So, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more. Now let's get back to the story. Sergei Vasilievich Rykovsky was born on December 29, 1962, in a place called Saltykovka, near a city named Balashika in Moscow, Russia. He was a very tall man, measuring 6 feet 6 inches and weighing 280 pounds. In his childhood, Sergei was much bigger than other kids his age. At just 6 months old, he already weighed 11 kilograms, but unfortunately, he had weak health. He was often sick and had frequent colds. At one point, Sergei Ryakovsky had pneumonia, which led to him developing asthma. His mother was always very concerned about his health and gave him a lot of attention, sometimes even being overprotective. Apart from Sergei's health issues, he also faced difficulties with speaking. Young Sergei didn't start talking until he was three years old. It was later discovered that he had brain damage from birth trauma. When Sergei was born, he was too big for a natural delivery. But the doctors didn't want to do a caesarean section, which resulted in a series of health issues for the young lad. Because of Sergei's health problems, he couldn't go to kindergarten. And when he even started school, he often missed classes due to frequent illness. Sergei was shy, quiet, and preferred to keep to himself. He barely interacted with his classmates, and they sometimes made fun of him. This was partly because his mother used to accompany him to school until he was 11 or 12 years old, which made other kids laugh at him. Despite his difficulties, Sergei had a soft side. He loved animals. Once, he found a stray kitten on the street and brought it home. Seeing how much he cared for the kitten, his parents allowed him to keep it. Unfortunately, the kitten fell ill and passed away, leaving Sergei devastated. He grieved inconsolably for a month. Similarly, when the family's parrot died, Sergi was deeply saddened. Since Sergi had no friends, he spent his time at home alone. After completing college to study as an electrician, Sergei worked in the field for only a year at a local factory. He struggled to find stable employment and mostly relied on his parents' retirement benefits. In matters of love, Sergei never found success in his romantic relationships. At one time, it was reported that Sergei was in a relationship with a girl, and they went on several dates together. However, the girl felt uneasy when Sergei was around because of his aggressive nature. She described him as someone who often tried to start arguments or fights with people. Eventually, the girl ended the relationship as quickly as she could. Many people, including those who initially had a positive opinion of Sergei, also noticed his aggressive behavior and his difficulty in communicating with others. It was speculated that Sergei's failure in his romantic relationships and his inability to form a connection with a girl his age may have led him to commit his first crime. In 1982, 
Rykovsky claimed he began to feel an irresistible desire for intimacy with a woman, and made several attempts to rape elderly women in the Golianovo area of East Moscow, for which he was convicted of hooliganism and received a four-year sentence in prison. In Russia, there's a belief that individuals who committed sexual assaults in prison are often subjected to rape by other inmates. Unfortunately, this was the case for Sergei Rakovsky during his time in jail, which likely had a significant impact on his mental health. After his release in 1986, Sergei Rakovsky felt compelled to attack and kill homosexuals. He held the belief that they would reincarnate as what he considered normal people after their deaths. However, Sergei didn't plan to stop attacking women either. This time, though, he decided not to leave any survivors. His first attempt to attack a woman again was on January 3, 1988, but she managed to survive. On June 19, 1988, Sergei Rykovsky committed his first murder. He killed a homosexual man named Anatoly Vilkin in Bitsa, a village in Moscow Oblast on the outskirts of Moscow. Sergei Rykovsky met Vilkin, who was at the time concealing his homosexuality from those around him. Despite having a family and children, Vilkin engaged in soliciting other men for money. Sergei Rykovsky and Viklin traveled to a village called Bitsa in the Moscow region. Known for the nearby Bitsa Park where another serial killer, Alexander Pichishkin, operated at the time. However, their journey didn't lead to Vilkin's country house as planned. Instead, Sergei attacked him as they entered the forest. He assaulted Vilkin with a screwdriver, removed his clothes, and positioned the body on a fallen birch tree, intending to send a message about the victim's sexuality to anyone who found it. That same year, Sergei Rakovsky committed a series of murders in Azmailovsky Park, targeting three homosexual men. Even though Rakovsky stated that these killings were part of his personal mission to clean society by eliminating what he perceived as undesirable elements, including homosexuals and prostitutes, the majority of his victims between 1988 and 1993 were mainly elderly women. The next victim in Sergei Rakovsky's spree was once again an elderly woman, Klavdia Koklova, aged 70. He approached her from behind and attacked her with a screwdriver, striking her about 14 times. After the assault, he stole some money from her and fled. Although Sergei Rakovsky believed he had killed her, she was later found alive by her neighbor. Unfortunately, Klavdia couldn't describe her attacker as she hadn't seen his face, and she passed away in the hospital the next day. Following this attack, there was a six-month gap before Sergei Rykovsky struck again, and the next incident was unexpected, even for him. On January 2, 1989, 16-year-old Vitaly Zaitsev accidentally collided with Sergei while skiing in a park. Sergei became enraged when Vitaly didn't apologize and proceeded to strangle the boy. Sergei also went ahead to further commit horrifying acts, assaulting Vitaly's body, which became a pattern in many of his subsequent crimes. After killing Vitaly, Sergei Rykovsky took the boy's skis with him, but discarded them nearby as he left the scene. Initially, this murder was attributed to another serial killer, Sergei Golovkin. But Golovkin had an alibi for the day of Vitaly's murder, leading the police to realize it wasn't him. Sergei Rykovsky's next two murders occurred in July 1990 and February 1991. The first victim was a 45-year-old woman whose head was severed and left beside her body. The second victim, Tatiana Norkina, aged 48, was also skying when she was killed. At this crime scene, Sergei Rykovsky left behind one of his gloves, which later proved to be a critical piece of evidence. When Sergei Rykovsky was apprehended and shown a photo of Tatiana's corpse, he surprisingly requested to keep it, remarking that it looked beautiful. This disturbing behavior hinted at the depths of his depravity. In September 1992, Sergei Rykovsky targeted a homosexual man named Nikolai Belkin, aged 60. After being propositioned for sex, Sergei Rykovsky lured Belkin to a secluded area in a park and murdered him with a knife. 
Despite typically favoring improvised weapons, Sergei Rakovsky always carried a knife with him, but seldom used it on his victims. About a month later, another murder occurred in the same area under similar circumstances. This time, the victim was Oleg Bolden, age 38, and Rykovsky strangled him. In both cases, the murderer's sperm was found at the crime scenes, which helped the police confirm that the same person committed the murders. At that time, the police had no idea that all these people were killed by one person, as the victims were different, and nobody suspected a serial killer. About 15 different criminal cases were opened. The next two attacks were fortunately unsuccessful. In December 1992, Sergei Rykovsky attempted to attack a 60-year-old woman named Mukina, but she resisted and screamed for help, causing Sergei Rykovsky to flee. About a month later, he attempted to attack another elderly woman, who also managed to escape and inform the police. This case was different because the woman remembered what Sergei Rykovsky looked like and described him. In other cases, even if the victim survived the attack, they couldn't describe him as he mostly attacked from behind. Based on the woman's description, the police created a facial composite, which aided in Rakovsky's later arrest. However, before this happened, several more people were killed. In January 1993, Rykovsky encountered 73-year-old Andrei Osipov in a forest. Osipov attempted to defend himself with an axe, but Rykovsky took the axe and used it to kill him. He then decapitated his victim and returned the next day to cut off his leg. Strangely, Sergei Rykovsky had a habit of going back to where he committed his heinous crimes. It was like he couldn't resist going back to those places, almost like they were calling out to him. It seemed like he found some kind of satisfaction in going back there, maybe to remember how he felt when he did those awful things or to feel powerful again. This made him even more complicated and creepy, showing just how much he was obsessed with violence and death. In March 1993, Sergei Rykovsky brutally murdered 55-year-old Olga Shuko after torturing her. He used a weak pyrotechnical device to rupture her abdomen, causing devastating injuries. Sergei Rykovsky's second-to-last victim was 16-year-old Renat Kabibulin, who was a student at a school for children with mental retardation. Sergei Rykovsky approached Renat, gaining his trust and persuading him to follow him into the forest under the guise of helping him with math homework. Once in the forest, Rykovsky's actions turned chaotic. His brutality escalated even further. He hanged the boy, followed by evisceration, and ultimately cut off his head using a knife and discarded his body 40 meters away from the crime scene. Afterward, Rykovsky burned Renat's school books in a fire. After his arrest, Sergei Rykovsky couldn't explain his actions leaving the police puzzled as to his motives. These savage and merciless actions depict the depths of Rakovsky's depravity and the sheer horror inflicted upon his victims. In an attempt to confuse investigators, Rakovsky committed another murder on April 12, 1993. He attacked Anna Narcision, who resisted by spraying pepper spray into his face. However, Rakovsky persisted and ultimately killed Anna after disarming her. On her body, he left a message saying, Hello from Chechnya, perhaps intending to mislead the police into thinking that the crime was committed by Chechen criminals. However, his ploy failed, as Sergei Rykovsky was arrested the next day. However, the bodies of Anna and Renat were only discovered after his arrest. It happened that during a routine search of Olga Shuko's murder scene area, Police investigators discovered a shack with a noose attached to the ceiling. Suspecting it was part of a murderer's preparation for his next murder, they opted to set up an ambush. On April 13, 1993, Rykovsky made a deliberate choice to revisit the site where he had committed the heinous act of murdering Olga Shuko in March 1993, as was his unsettling custom. At this point, the police were already patrolling the area. They noticed a suspicious man and approached him, pretending to ask for a cigarette. Sergei didn't respond and instead tried to run away. 
However, there's another version that suggests Rykovsky didn't resist and surrendered immediately. Regardless, the police arrested him. Upon searching his pockets, they found a piece of rope, the same rope that was hanging in the mysterious shed. Despite his formidable strength and violent nature, Rykovsky offered no resistance during his arrest. He later confessed that upon seeing weapons in the hands of the officers, he was overcome with fear and unable to react. Despite Sergei Ryakovsky's arrest, the police continued their investigation. At the scene where Shuko's body was discovered, the police found her glasses. These glasses became a crucial piece of evidence as Sergei Ryakovsky's fingerprint was found on them. However, the results of the fingerprint analysis arrived too late, as Sergei Rakovsky had already been taken into custody. While reporting the news of Sergei Rakovsky's arrest, the Russian press gave him nicknames such as the Balashika Ripper and the Hippopotamus due to his thick neck and imposing stature. During the investigation, Sergei Rakovsky cooperated with officials and investigators willingly pointing out crime scenes and describing his methods of killing. According to his confessions, most of the murders were not premeditated but rather impulsive acts. He explained that the motivation behind some of the killings, such as those of a 70-year-old woman and a 78-year-old man he encountered in the forest, stemmed from sudden impulses. However, there were exceptions, such as the meticulously planned murders of three homosexuals he met in Ismailovsky Park in 1988. Most of Sergei Rakovsky's victims were people over 40 or around 50 years old, with three of them being over 60 years old. In Rakovsky's apartment, officers discovered a diary where he documented information about his victims. In the diary, there was a picture featuring a skeleton, likely symbolizing death. There were 12 blue rectangles and 7 red rectangles, resembling small coffins. These coffins symbolized his victims, with the red ones representing women and the blue ones representing men. This detail raised some confusion because it indicated there were a total of 19 victims, which aligned with Rykovsky's statement in one of his interviews where he mentioned being accused of 19 murders. However, information about only 11 victims was available publicly, suggesting there might be additional victims whose details remain confidential. Apart from the diary, police also found a short science fiction novel written by Sergei Rakovsky. He was keenly interested in science fiction and particularly fond of authors like Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov. Inspired by his passion for the genre, Sergei Rakovsky crafted a story about a futuristic state security officer named Starfall, tasked with hunting down space pirates and other criminals. Sergei Rakovsky had written three different versions of the novel, but none of them had an ending. It seemed that he was unsure of how he wanted to conclude his story, and perhaps he didn't place much importance on the ending. What truly fascinated him in the writing process was describing scenes of murder and repression, reflecting his dark and disturbed mindset. According to psychiatrists from the Moscow Serbsky Institute, Sergei Ryakovsky's necrophiliac tendencies were attributed to a malfunction in his central nervous system. Despite this diagnosis, he was evaluated as mentally sound, deemed fit for trial, and held fully responsible for his actions. However, following the revelation of his diagnosis, Sergei Rykovsky's behavior underwent a significant transformation. Initially, he confessed to the murders and cooperated fully with investigators. However, after learning of his diagnosis, his behavior suddenly shifted. He became obstructive, ceased cooperation, and demanded the expert's punishment. He also retracted his previous confessions, claiming that he was not guilty of the murders and that he had confessed only under police pressure and violence. During the 1993 Russian constitutional crisis, President Boris Yeltsin dissolved parliament, which was not legally permissible under the constitution in force at that time. Consequently, on September 23, the parliament declared Vice President Alexander Rutskoy as the acting president, sparking a conflict that escalated into street battles. Sergei Rakovsky, who supported the Supreme Soviet, wrote a letter to Alexander Rutskoy 
asserting his innocence and portraying himself as a victim of the anti-national authority, that's of Yeltsin's regime, and pleading for leniency. Rykovsky likely feared severe punishment, given that many serial killers of that era were sentenced to death, which ultimately became his fate as well. In July 1995, Ryakovsky was sentenced to death by firing squad. Upon hearing the verdict, he defiantly declared, I will be back. However, in 1996, Russia imposed a moratorium on executions, leading to his sentence being commuted to life imprisonment. He was transferred to a maximum security penal colony in Sosnovka, zubovo polyensky district, Mordovia. In prison, other inmates, many of whom were murderers themselves, were afraid of Sergei Ryakovsky. He spent his days reading science fiction books and writing his memoirs. Despite reaching out to his mother through numerous letters, she never responded or visited him, leaving him feeling abandoned. The only person Sergei Ryakovsky found some common ground in prison was a man named Sergei Kvastinov, who was incarcerated for murdering a statesman and his family. They bonded over discussions about space and astronomy, with Sergei Ryakovsky often reading his favorite sci-fi books to Kastanov before bedtime. However, even though they shared common interests, Kvastinov admitted that Ryakovsky had a challenging personality to deal with. Despite the news of Ryakovsky's death circulating in the mass media in 2005, he actually passed away on November 12, 2007, due to tuberculosis. All right, guys, that wraps up our video for today. If you found this video informative, please give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more.